Good. Uh, yeah, so um, a lot of the talk today has been around MOOCs and things, but I kind of want to, in this session, I think, to kind of talk a bit about how you can see MOOCs as part of a, a broader movement of, of openness in, in education um, and how we're kind of at a particular time frame in, in that open education movement. So I've written this book called The Battle for Open. Um, so uh, I'm a big open access advocate, so it's available freely now, uh, published by Ubiquiti. You can buy the physical copy if you want, but you can download the Kindle version. So it's under a Creative Commons license, so it's been freely available and you can take it and adapt it and do what you want with it. Um, this is kind of a bit of a condensed bit of that talk. The, book. The, the, the kind of central theme is that in many ways openness as an approach in education has been victorious. Kind of, it's moved from being a very peripheral interest to almost in the mainstream now, or stands in the cusp of the mainstream. So in some ways, it's a, this is a period of victory. With kind of things, things like MOOCs, open access, uh, publishing and stuff. Um, but actually, it's often at that very point of victory that the real direction of things are decided. And I think there's some nice um, kind of historical analogies here. So, there's this French tradition in history called the, the long durée, which kind of says you shouldn't look at the kind of the big peaks or the, the kind of the big stories like French Revolution. Actually, you should look at, uh, over longer cycles. That's when you actually see change. And actually, even after a big revolution, a lot of those things still persist. That's so you, you saw that with the French Revolution. So, you know, so it might seem like a big victory, but actually, the next ten years felt quite <laughs> with the Jacobites were actually quite rough. And you've seen it with the kind of the, uh, the Arab revolutions as well recently. So, a lot of those people after those big revolutions kind of found themselves thinking like, this doesn't feel like victory much. So actually, I think it's after those initial victories that actually the direction of things are kind of slightly um, So in this talk, I want to first do a pitch about why you should care about openness at all in education, and then think about why we might think of it in terms of a battle. Um, talk about some of the roots of open education, and I've heard some of the conversations that people have come to open education from different areas. For some people, it's about things being free. For other people, it's about you know, open universities, those kind of things. Uh, and then talk about some of those battle fronts and then some conclusions. Um, so this whole project is about open educational practice. So I'm going to try and make a pitch to you, and you can disagree with me, but this is my pitch. The kind of impact across every aspect of educational practice. So some bits might be more relevant to you than others. But I think eventually we'll get to some point. So I'm going to go through just three areas of kind of um, academic practice and just give an example of how openness um, influences that. So if research is your bag, um, what openness gives you is, is new methodologies, new ways of conducting your research, a new dissemination routes. It's not just about going through uh, traditional publications, you can blog, or something like that, or you can go for open access publishing, and that generally has a um, higher citations and high impacts. It also kind of gives you novel ways of collaborating with people through these kind of online networks before and that kind of identity you establish online. So an example is what I like to call the idea of guerrilla research, um, which are kind of very quick ways of doing things. Uh, so it came out of um, interface design, these guys, you know, so they're, just, they're faster, lower cost methods to kind of get you to where you want. And I think there's a way of doing this in academic um, research as well. So, the traditional research process is over on the left. You can have an idea, you write a proposal, you submit that proposal to a funding body, you wait a really long time usually, you'll probably get rejected. Uh, say you're one of the few that actually get some funding, then you might do some research for a couple of years, and in that you might write a paper, and then wait a really long time again, and eventually it's published. So it's kind of a, there's a, a certain time frame that goes with that kind of traditional research, which you'll know. Um, whereas, Stuff and white is kind of the idea of this guerrilla research. You have an idea, you find some open data, you do that research in an afternoon, blog it, and you're, you're done. So, uh, obviously, but they're not kind of in competition. You, know, but you need to do this research, but if you're building a, a large hadron collider, you're probably not going to do that in your back garden. Um, so, you're going to need that kind of funding. But there's, there's ways of doing other types of research that openness allows. So, my kind of manifesto for guerrilla research is that. Um, it doesn't necessarily require a team, it doesn't require you to get lots of people together. Um, it usually relies on existing open data information tools, so you, you don't need to get permissions to do it. It's fairly quick to realise you just get out there and do it. 
Um, you can find other acceleration routes. So you, you can publish as well. Uh, but I think the key thing is that it doesn't require permission. You don't need anyone's permissions to do it. Maybe some of your own time. But that's about it. So um, an example is uh, you probably know this, but travel blogs that are kept by people who kind of travel around the world are kind of a really rich source of information and knowledge. So people have started doing research as travel blogs. So um, this one uses a board easier lens to examine ideas of, of, of identity. Uh, of people's blogs who might be travelling uh, uh, climbing Mount Everest. This one looks at um, travel blogs as, as a form of marketing and how they compare to traditional forms. Uh, this one looks at the, it's become such a thing now, that this one looks at the methodology of using travel blogs as an, an approach. This one looks, um, there's a really good book actually uh, about how people identify themselves as, as travellers rather than tourists. The tourists have to be disdained, but all people who keep travel blogs are travellers. Um, so the point is that all this, these papers, these publications, were based on open data. So people just writing these blogs. They didn't need permission, you might argue. Yeah. Um, so they just used open data to go away and do this research. They didn't need anyone's permission. And if you think, Previously, what you needed to do in order to, to get that kind of data, you'd have had to get people to sign up to your project and agree to keep a travel journal as they go around the world and stuff. And you could just, they can just go and do this now. So, there's a different type of research you can just conduct because people are operating in the open. So, you know, the key to that is it's kind of a very DIY approach, no, no permission required, there's a rich source of data. Uh, previously, it required interviews, recruitment, budget, that kind of stuff. And it uses a slightly different method. Um, another quick example. Um, so, Katie Jordan is my PhD student, uh, and she's doing a, and she's looking at um, network analysis of uh, academia.edu and Twitter, and, and looking at how people kind of form those networks online. And so, she wants to understand more about um, network analysis. So, she took a, a, a MOOC on um, graph. Uh, using those kind of tools and stuff. And, and the final assignment was to create your own kind of online graphic representation. And so she thought, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find all the data about MOOC completion rates and blog about it and plot all, all the different MOOCs and the completion rates and kind of interactive graph online. But she blogs and sort of made open. And this guy, Phil Hill, blogs at a, a site called eLiterate, which is kind of a big, one of the big US blogs in, in my field of tech. So he, he saw Kate's piece and said, oh, this is the most complete picture we've seen of mood completion rates, which were kind of a really big topic back in 2013. So Katie's bit, Katie's piece, it got picked up by everybody and became kind of the de facto piece to talk about completion rates. It even got featured in Private Eye. We were then invited to submit funding for to uh, the Gates uh, Mood Research Initiative to kind of follow up on that work. So we got a bit of funding to do that in case there's more work. And there was a conference in Dallas and journal, journal articles. So all this kind of followed because Katie was taking an open course and she found open data that people had published and then she used open tools to, uh, to plot it and, and disseminate it openly on her own blog. So it's kind of openness runs through that whole kind of story. Uh, I think if teaching is important to you, there are openness impacts in different ways. There's lots of open content you can find and use. Um, I like the kind of idea of open boundaries between universities now. So it's not just you know, don't have to be on campus to do stuff. They do MOOCs or open educational resources, so people can have an association with your university, even no matter where they're located. Um, people start talking about open pedagogy, so kind of get much more uh, crowdsource involvement and um, being open to different types of content coming to your course, um, and adaptation, being able to take other content and adapt it to fit into your content. So, uh, as Bayer said, we run the OER Research Hub. So, um, just as an example, there's lots of stuff here that might impact upon what you're doing. So, uh, we, we did a big survey of nearly 7,000, over 7,000 people, educators and learners, using different OER repositories. Um, and so, just over half the learners said that, that using OER improved their <coughs> satisfaction. So, when they were studying the course, being able to use different resources improved their satisfaction. Also, overall, um, about a third of them said they felt they got better test scores as a result of using OERs. Um, yeah, just pick up some other ones. Um, 
Okay, so right, yeah, this one here is quite interesting. So 31% of informal learners who were looking at OER, so they were doing it, so they wanted to try university level content before signing up for study. Um, that's probably, this was kind of a global audience, right? It's particularly true if you're in England and you're about to pay £9,000 to go to university, then you probably want to make sure that you're, you know, that's the course you want to study. So, just as a way of kind of recruiting students or, or making sure that they're ready to come and stay, study with you is important. Um, so, uh, um, about 24% were also in formal education and using OERs to supplement their studies. So, you, know, you might think that you know, you're giving out all the information that students need, but they're probably sitting in the back of your classroom uh, looking at uh, an iTunes U lecture from Stanford or something. So it's helping to kind of support what they're doing as well. So just, so even if you're kind of unaware of it, or don't care about OERs, it still might be having an impact upon the, the learners that you're, you're getting and how they're then coping within your own um, situation. And the last point I was just about <coughs> the online identity we develop as, as academics. Um, I think we often kind of posit this as being in, in competition with your traditional identity, but actually I think they're quite complementary. So um, there's been some research done, some articles that are tweeted tend to kind of get higher citations. Certainly open access articles have higher downloads and views than those that are kind of behind a paywall. Um, Blogging, when papers are blogged, if, if that person's got a good online identity, it tends to lead to more downloads. And also, you get a lot of the kind of stuff around personal reputation and, and keynote invites, all those kind of things that we think matter in the, in the formal world, are often driven by that online identity. Okay, um, so my pitch is that you shouldn't think of kind of this idea of open practice being that's another thing I've got to do. It's not kind of in addition to what you do, but I think it, it potentially influences kind of every aspect of your, of your normal life. So therefore, its direction is important to us, which brings me on to the, the idea of it being a battle. Now I think I'm slightly wary of using this kind of military language, but I think there are certain aspects of a battle that are useful to think about in certain characteristics. So there are three that I want to focus on. First of all, there, can't, there actually really are, there are real areas of conflict and about the direction for openness. So what some universities might want and what commercial publishers want from openness are, are very different things. So actually there are real battles we're fighting. Uh, you talk about open textbooks. It's often seen in that kind of open textbook world where people like Pearson's you know, really don't want and they're kind of trying to undermine a lot of the open textbooks. Approach, so they can see it's going to hit their market. Uh, actually, the reason often we fight battles, and real battles, is because there's, there's money involved. Um, and so the education market is estimated to be worth something like $6 trillion worldwide. Uh, and Pearson's, this is a, a commercial publisher, has something like a £2 billion pound turnover. So there's real money to be fought over here, and that, of course, gets people's interest. Um, and lastly, one I find quite interesting is this idea about who gets to write the narrative about openness and uh, open education. So, so the, the victor writes history, so I think there's a, there's a battle for narrative going on, and I'll explore that a bit later. So I wanted to talk about, for those kind of three areas, um, some of the roots of open education, because actually a lot of people come to, it's a very kind of vague term, openness or open education. Um, and people come to it with different assumptions and different perspectives. So actually, you might think you're talking about the same thing, but actually people have different values. And can value that. So um, there are three kind of main strands that come together in modern open education. I think. The first is um, open universities. So my university founded in 1969. The idea was about open access, like open entry. So the focus there was really on methods that allow people to do that. So the idea you could study at a distance, you could study at any time, it was asynchronous, um, you didn't need qualifications to sign up and join in. So it wasn't really about education being free, as in the sense of uh, MOOCs, those kind of things. It was much more about constructing a model that allowed open access and open entry to education. The next kind of important strand with this was the idea of uh, free or open source software. They're often lumped in together, but they are slightly different in terms of their philosophy. So 
free software was really kind of had a strong emphasis on rights. And it was a, I could take a piece of code and I had the right to look at it and change if I wanted and then pass it on to someone else. Uh, open source software has a similar emphasis, but really it was saying it wasn't about a kind of philosophical standpoint, it was really just about saying actually this is the most efficient way to create software programs and they're, they're mantras that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. So if you kind of open up to the community, other people will decode the stuff. Um, and it's a very good link between this movement and what's become kind of modern open education because uh, David Wiley was one of the kind of early proponents of open education. And when he, he wanted to release a book under an open license, he looked at the, the software licenses that come out of these movements and adapted those for his open textbook license. Um, and that and that license was what then became uh, Creative Commons. So there's a kind of a strong thread. Of that. And lastly, uh, it's kind of a term we don't use much now. I'm a bit embarrassed about it. But there's the whole kind of Web 2.0 explosion that happened in the, the mid 2000s. It really opened up the kind of culture of sharing. People just very easily being able to put stuff online, embed it, share it, distribute it, and kind of create this whole different distribution channel. So that just made sharing a much more normalised practice. I think. So I think what we get from this is that. Um, Open education isn't just one thing, it's not very easy to define, it's really a kind of set of coalescing principles around those, and some of those things will be more important to you depending on who you are. So for a lot of people, I think you've come out of that Web 2.0 world, it's really about being free. And free is the, is the main thing about open. Because you, if you come from that open source world, it's much more about what are the rights associated with this, and have I got the right to be able to distribute it and change it and attribute uh, it back. If you come from the open university world, it's much more about the learner perspective you know, and being able to support learners to open access to open uh, So I think there are some kind of common themes to all of those three strands. They often start with this kind of belief that openness is a public good. It's kind of quite an altruistic belief. This is something that we should do. It's a good thing to do. Um, it's often resisted then, so... Uh, this is going to get in the line. Perhaps uh, it's so, <laughs> So it's often resisted. So if you think of the, uh, the Open University, there was quite a lot of resistance to the Open University at the start. Um, and for instance, when we wanted to run summer schools, uh, nearly all the major universities wouldn't allow the Open University on campus. They were kind of resistant to it. And it was said that you know, distance education was low quality, you couldn't work that. that. There's a story that the Open University considered quite seriously, I wasn't around that, um, because they couldn't get on campus through summer schools. They were going to hire a cruise ship and just kind of cruise around <laughs> the UK doing summer schools. <laughs> so we eventually got campuses. So, so there's this kind of resistance from the, the, the incumbents and the kind of traditional community. And eventually it gets accepted and moves into the mainstream. So can you with the Open University example, um, you know, the Open University got accepted, it's become kind of a national institution, that kind of stuff. And after that, uh, the approach has become adopted and, and adapted. So you know, so other universities now start doing distance education and blended learning and all this. And you see that through all of those three things. So to look at those, those battle fronts, so the first one is about this idea about a battle for belief. You know, what, are the, what are the core values that actually we're, we're, we're fighting over this? And it's interesting the way openness has become kind of adopted by a lot of people. So, um, Udacity was one of the, the, the MOOC providers. They put very restrictive contracts you sign when you sign up with them. So uh, Georgia Tech um, created a, a master's course with them. And their, their contract with Udacity says that Georgia Tech can't offer its own content that's given in the MOOC anywhere else. But Udacity can take that content and use it elsewhere. That doesn't feel like a very open and friendly relationship. It feels quite restrictive. Uh, Sebastian Svan was the founder of Udacity and the kind of yeah, person often put forward as the kind of godfather of MOOCs. Um, and he sort of said in the interview there will be only 10 global providers of education in the future. And we want Udacity to be one of them. Um, and again, that doesn't feel like a very open, friendly environment. And if you compare that with the Hewlett Foundation's definition of, of open education resources, they kind of really emphasize that the point of these things is that, is that they allow free use and repurposing rather. That's that kind of the sole purpose of their existence is to be free and open. And, uh, so there's a very kind of different tone between those two worlds. They're both talking about open. And I think it's important because um, 
Again, I'm coming out of our OER research hub work. We've looked at types of people who might use OERs. So the first group are what we might call OER active, people who care about open education resources, they know about Creative Commons licenses, they're kind of engaged in that community. Um, and that's good, and they've been very successful with the OER community to be very successful in growing that, that community over the past sort of 10 years or so, so it's kind of got a global community. But you can't, you can't make everybody become OER active. You know? People are, are busy doing other things. You know? um, the next group is the idea of OER as facilitators. So these people who really want to do something else, and OER allow them to do that. So we work with the flipped learning network, for instance. The idea of flipping your classroom is that you use the face-to-face -face part of your classroom for doing interactive group work, dynamic stuff, and the kind of homework is to watch videos or do stuff online, which is kind of much more just information and distribution. So for them, you actually want, what they're actually interested in doing is flipping their classroom. So OERs, if there are good OERs around it, that means they can say, go home and watch these four videos about this subject and tomorrow we'll come in and we'll discuss it. So OERs allow them to do something else. And the last one is the study of, kind of OER consumers. They're not really worried about rights and those kind of things. These are good quality content. So that those students who are um, using OER to supplement their study are kind of a good example of that. And, and the, point, the reason why it's interesting to think things like those, those groups is that if, open, if the direction of openness becomes closed down now, kind of owned by, by commercial entities, then there are quite a lot of groups, and you probably could think of that as a kind of a typical iceberg model, that the kind of OER active people at the top, they might not be affected because they can carry on their but there's a lot of people who will be affected without even knowing that, that, that they needed stuff to be open, and it will be closed down to the point. So the second of those battle fronts is the idea that there's, there's real money involved here. Uh, and here I'm going to look a bit at open access publishing. So um, this graph plots uh, open access journals and open access articles um, since 93. You'll be able to spot a trend there, so it's, kind of, it's all going one way. Uh, and we start it, well, I'm getting in. <laughs> uh, anyway. So we established two ways of um, getting to open access publishing. So the gold route is that uh, we use traditional, we use journals still, and either they're free because they're paid for by society, or you pay um, article processing charges as an author, and that allows them to, to continue with the idea of a journal and publish it uh, openly. Well, the green route is that you self archive, so uh, you might have an institutional repository, and you put up articles there, or your own website. So the point is, we've kind of established quite robust ways of making uh, journal articles open access. And there are kind of major policies in, in many countries now. So in the UK, we have the Finch Report. It says any publicly funded research, the publications that come out of that need to be made open access. So if the public are paying for this research to be conducted, they have a right to have access to, to the outlets. Uh, the publisher Wiley conducted a survey of their authors uh, last year, I think it was. And they found for the first time ever, more than 50% of those authors had kind of published open access journals. So it's kind of reached a tipping point. This goes back to that argument about openness is one in a way because it may not be, it's not 100%, but it's kind of certainly moving into the mainstream. So for a long time, publishers tried to fight open access, saying open access journals aren't as good. Uh, they, they realize they can't fight it anymore. So they, they move on to a, another tactic now. And one of these is what's called the, the hybrid root swindle. It's a fantastic idea. I applaud them really. So the idea is that you, you pay for an article to be published open access uh, in a particular journal, but not all articles in that journal are open access. So they still charge the library the subscription fee to that. This is what's called um, double dipping. So they get paid twice for the same thing, which is brilliant. <laughs> so uh, the World Trust did an analysis from 2012-2013. Uh, they said academics spent 3.88 million to publish articles, paying those article process charges. And then 3.17 million is then paid again through libraries to have access to those very So, <laughs> and um, so these people did a, an analysis over five years of uh, looking at the cost per article. And they found for just pure open access journals, it averaged out £1,164 and it was £1,849 for uh, hybrid journals. So, 
it's just kind of an idea about that, the, the battle for open. So we kind of have made the, the, the case for open access. That it's kind of there's almost a moral right, moral case for publicly funded research to be available. Um, the publishers resisted it and they went, hold on, we can make money out of this again. So that that's the kind of direction of it has been taken over with this idea of um, hyper journals. And going inside this, we start to see predatory open access journals uh, start up. So some of you may have had emails from you know, publishers you've never heard from saying, please publish in our journal, and you go to the site and they've got some kind of 4,000 different journal articles and titles. But I've never heard of any of these before, and they're really just a kind of vanity publishing. You, you sort of pay three thousand pounds to publish it, and then publish it with no quality. And just in general, education seems the kind of the next big target for technology venture capitalists. So there was a report in the New York Times this year saying that last year uh, venture funding went up to one point eight seven billion. Uh, it was about fifty five percent of the year before. So. The kind of the, the eye of Wardour has come up, has cast itself upon education and gone, that's the next big target. We need, we need some of that. So people start to use this phrase open washing. So you may have heard of green washing. The idea is green washing is that you know, as soon as green stopped being just a niche interest that only hippies are interested in, it, and actually it's got market value, the idea of green and nature and eco. And so people start to pretend their product is green, use kind of connotations of nature. So We've seen the Beyond Petroleum adverts for BP. Um, so the idea of open washing is that you can pretend to be open. So you take, take the idea of openness because it suddenly has um, commercial value and start trying to use it. So uh, Udacity, I'm rather picking on Udacity, not, so the Open Education Alliance, that sounds great. Um, but when you look at what I said, it's an interesting wide alliance of employers, so things like Google are in there. Microsoft thing and educators that serve the students throughout the world provides access to cutting edge and relevant post secondary education that empowers individuals to pursue successful careers in technology. There's, there's nothing in there about openness, you know, all, all our stuff will be available for others to use or free, and like that. So it's kind of the same idea of open, but then not follow through on any of those kind of principles. And I think about, have, have any of you ever been to a safari park? I went to Longley once and, and it's quite a good Monkeys kind of jump on your car and they're kind of, aren't they cute? Hey, it's monkeys and they're smiling at you and kind of, and then they start jumping on top and they start ripping your area off and your windscreen wipes off. That slightly feels like what's happened with some of the idea around openness. New people come into the field, hey, they're, they're part of us. It's all the same thing and then they start hijacking what the term means. Which brings me on to this idea about uh, the battle for narrative. I think. MOOCs are a really interesting uh, example here. So, um, this is a, a Google Trends graph that kind of compares relative mentions um, on the internet. So, the blue line is OERs, which kind of bump along quite nicely, you know, gaining reputation, gaining awareness. And then in 2012, from nowhere, MOOCs come along, like, bam, overtake them. So, they kind of really hit the, the media spotlight, and suddenly everyone was interested in MOOCs. Google Trends are a great thing to do even if you don't do this. Just, kind of just in case you think books are actually important, sometimes we always do a comparison with Kim Kardashian and that's <laughs> like just how important you really are. So books don't think at all compared to what people actually talk about. So, you know, the internet is really interesting. But it was interesting uh, kind of living through that uh, MOOC hype in a way. So um, suddenly we had major MOOC providers starting up from, from nowhere, so we had, we had Future Learn. Coursera, edX, Udacity, uh, Openware, of course, uh, a few others. But in, in, in most countries start up with major group. And you can think, we've been struggling for years to get stuff. And got, they're just sort of coming out of the window for something that's got really rapid progress. Uh, and millions have enrolled once. I forget what Coursera's figures are up to. It's about 80 million, I think. Right. We know a lot of those people don't complete or even turn up. But so those are impressive numbers, you know. If you are interested in open education, the fact that millions of people are just expressing an interest in it is, is exciting. There was major media coverage. We kind of there are people on news nights. And before and you couldn't get you know, my dog would listen to me about open educational resources. And someone like, everyone was ringing up. Can you talk about MOOCs and about MOOCs and stuff? And uh, 
for people being parents of in, in the New York Times, all this kind of stuff. And you've never got a story about open education before. So uh, George Siemens, uh, if education was like grunge rock, then the MOOCs were like Nirvana, the kind of breakthrough act that suddenly everyone wanted to do so. I think what's interesting is kind of very strong uh, Silicon Valley type narrative underlying the whole point of MOOCs, and particularly the, the reason why the media were so interested in them. I think there's kind of several elements there. So first of all, there's this idea, and you'd often see this quoted almost as kind of incontrovertible fact, that people say education is broken, and therefore we need to do a massive change. So um, Kay Shirky is kind of a prominent blog in terms of the education space is massive, very broken. Uh, you may have heard the, the Pearson's Avalanche report that came out in the UK last year. So the models of higher education that march triumphantly across the globe in the second half of the 20th century are broken. Uh, there was a company called Degree.com had a kind of campaign where people were told with photographs that say education is broken, somebody should do something. That's someone would be in them. Uh, Sebastian Thrum, this is one of my favourite quotes ever. Education is broken, face it. It's so broken that so many ends, it requires a little bit of Silicon Valley magic. So only Silicon Valley. Can, but they never say what actually is broken about education. It's kind of just balls. We're also obsessed with this idea of disruption in, in newspapers and Silicon Valley. So, uh, so Clayton Christensen wrote this book about, called The Innovator's Dilemma. It was actually quite a good book at the time. Um, and he was saying about how some technologies are disruptive. So. Um, the idea is that, so for instance, uh, the digital camera disrupted the, um, the traditional camera market. And that, that's true, and it kind of completely changed that market. But it's one of those ideas that was actually quite good, but has been applied to everything. So if, if you work with software, or all these kind of companies, what they really want to do is, is disrupt it. So you kind of nobody is necessarily disrupting an in, in industry. The idea of disruption is that you, you sweep away the previous industry and, and replace it with a new one. So Clayton himself has looked at schools and says disruption is a necessary and overdue chapter. Uh, that avalanche report I mentioned kind of justifies itself by saying in the Christmas of sermons, universities are ripe for disruption. Uh, and this guy was looking at open education resources and was criticising them because they haven't disrupted education. So they might be useful, but if, if the, the only, so disruption is the kind of only mark of success. So you kind of create this. Um, Parody in that uh, campaign they had there. Um, this kind of irresistible story for, for a lot of the media. So, you know, the education is broken, it's ripe for disruption, and they're obsessed with kind of technology solutions um, and also outsiders with new ideas sort of coming in to, to save the industry from itself. And then, what we have, and then, you know, lo and behold, 2012 was the year of the MOOC. It's going to sweep, it's going to be the, de the death of the university. Um, and then that didn't happen within two years. The kind of and so now they start talking about, so this book is out called uh, The End of College, and he's complaining about why MOOCs failed. Now, I don't think MOOCs did fail, they're kind of very interesting and stuff, but they didn't. But because they're so obsessed about disruption, so it's the failure of MOOCs to disrupt higher education, so that they didn't, because they didn't do away with all universities, he, he thinks they failed. There's nothing to do with the quality of courses themselves, many of which are quite good. Colleges are holding technology at bay because the only thing which provides access to world class professors at an unbeatable price. So the, the failure of MOOC, as he sees it, is our fault for coming from nasty universities. So there's, kind of, there's a narrative, a new narrative coming out there, and it's like it, so we're kind of portrayed as the, as, the, as the bad guys in this, even though most MOOCs come from universities and are I think this is kind of also the sense that if you don't tell your story, then someone else tells it for you. So, um, online courses, which many of us have been running for years, I, I ran the only his first big online course in 1999, that's about 15,000 students. It wasn't a MOOC, but online courses and e learning has become synonymous with MOOCs now. And so, like, so the headline is, I've said that's online courses are rethought, not, not MOOCs in particular, but the whole of online teaching is going to be rethought. And, and it's very difficult to kind of fight against it. So you, you, you've seen, perhaps last year, people started using variations on the word MOOCs. We had Spock, which is a small private online course, which is just 
an online course. <laughs> Some people have that for years. And VOOT, which is a vocational open online course, and all sorts of variations. So, you know, just by rebranding something as a MOOC, you kind of you could get attention, which is a good thing in many ways, but it does mean that MOOCs kind of became the attention for what a lot of us were doing anyway. I think one of the dangers of this, um, of allowing the media to kind of tell a particular story that's driven by this whole uh, revolution idea, is that it creates false dichotomies, good versus evil unicorns, rather on one side or the other. So you're kind of either pro MOOC or anti MOOC, you're either uh, all for commercial disruption, or you're, you're saying universities are the only way to do things, you're saying education is broken, or there's nothing wrong with it. And I think you know, it's, it's boring, but you know, the truth usually lies in the middle of all those things. It's like trying to tread a, a sensible line and see, so MOOCs are good for some things, and they're probably not going to disrupt universities, but they might help over here for these type of problems. Um, but that, that kind of revolution driven narrative doesn't allow for that, that middle. Okay, so to think about some ideas from recent history. So, um, you put you a VLE here, I take it. So, are you blackboard? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. So, uh, I was VLE director at the Open University um, uh, in the early 2000s. So, VLEs provide quite an interesting lesson from the recent past. In some ways, they were really good. You know, we, we often had different people, different faculties doing different bits of e learning, using different systems, or creating their own stuff. By having a kind of universal system across the university, you could then upskill everybody, you could provide you know, uniform training. So it moved us over quite a long way very quickly in terms of e-learning. So I mean, everyone could have an e-learning course. Um, so it was great for kind of mainstreaming e-learning. But it also came with some problems. We often kind of outsourced that expertise. So we just, you know, we just take the next delivery of Moodle or the next delivery of uh, Blackboard. I think it leads to a process called uh, software sedimentation, but also kind of process sedimentation. So we built up processes around the VLE. So instead of thinking we're doing e-learning, it's just like, what is, the, what is our process for pushing stuff into Blackboard? We have a policy about that, rather than thinking about what are the innovative possibilities of e-learning. So I think the VLE got us quite far very quickly, and then became a barrier to come kind of going further. So uh, Jim Brew and Brian Lamb kind of wrote a piece about how um, the LMS or VLE was responsible for um, stopping innovation in lots of higher education. So they kind of had five main charges that kind of it, it privileges technology management mindset. It kind of meant to control what people do. Um, so it created silos, it doesn't allow people to kind of connect with the outside world and have some of those possibilities. Uh, so learners use a system that's really unlike anything else outside of education. So you're not learning kind of how to create an online identity that you carry with you. Um, cost is an interesting one. So there's kind of financial cost in buying the system, but also uh, a human resource cost. So you might have had an e-learning expert before, but that became the Blackboard expert, and they became the person responsible for putting stuff into Blackboard rather than thinking of new ways of doing e-learning. And they, they claim that you know, there's often a kind of loss of confidence. You kind of brought in these exciting educational technologists and then said to them, you're, you're the blackboard person, just kind of grinding through. And, and, and often it kind of limits other innovations. So like if you go to say, I want to, that these guys are big WordPress fans. I want to set up a WordPress installation. It's like, you know, we, we have blackboards to do our own, and that's the only thing we use to do it. So you kind of stop some of this. And the reason I think that's interesting is that it's a kind of historical lesson. I think we stand in a similar place in, in many ways with respect to openness. Uh, so, for example, MOOCs, um, it could, an easier route is to say we're going to sign up with Coursera or something and we'll just adopt them. But then, and that, that gets you quite far very quickly. You don't have to invent your own systems. And, and that's probably a perfectly valid thing to do. But we might end up in the same process. We just kind of have a very formalized system for this is how we do MOOCs. We do them the Coursera way. And the whole point of MOOCs is they're exciting because they allowed experimentation. With the, so the early MOOCs were um, often Canadians, people like uh, George Siemens and Stephen Downs, and they were exploring MOOCs because they wanted to think what are the possibilities for um, learning in the open and get people to connect with each other in the open. But 
So I think if we just outsource all of that knowledge and just kind of provide a regimented approach, we lose a lot of the, the possibilities that openness offers us. So, um, summing up, I think openness isn't just a kind of peripheral interest now, it kind of has an impact upon everything you do. Um, but I don't think that means that it's it's really important to everybody. I, I, you know, it's important to me and I accept that, but I think other people have other things to do. And so it's not the case that everyone needs to be thinking about open education all the time, but I think it will impact upon your practice at some point. And it's also not to say that um, everyone should be open all the time. I think there are, but there are perfectly good reasons to operate in a closed manner sometimes. So I think particularly with first year students, I think being, learning is quite a vulnerable process. You, know, and you kind of have to expose your ignorance in order to kind of learn. And so making them operate in the open it's quite a scary thing to do. So I think put them in a, a closed, walled garden, a kind of safe environment in the in the VLE is actually quite a good thing to do. I do think it's an idea about kind of there's a kind of battle for ownership about where does openness go now? Who gets to control that and decide that? So I think um, kind of talk, there are kind of a couple of things to just to kind of ponder for yourself. So, so why does openness really matter? So what's important about it? Is it about, is it just a good marketing tool? Is it about uh, the social good of universities? Those kind of things. So going back to those early groups we saw. And also, on a kind of more personal basis, what can it do for me? What's relevant to me? Is, it, is that idea of guerrilla research the thing that actually you could adopt? Is it teaching? Is it using OER? So, so what could openness really help benefit me in my practice? Um, so remember those kind of common themes that I brought up about the, those kind of three threads of openness. So I think the kind of bit of the idea of um, open education is it's a public good, it's kind of a good thing to do. Um, it's been resisted, so I think you can see the, the kind of open access arguments. And so I think it's, it's kind of there now. It's kind of on the point of becoming mainstream. But that's not inevitable. It could go off and become kind of a peripheral interest. It, it could wither and die. It could be sort of taken over by commercial interests and just become a, you know, a very different beast. So this path down to here, which is probably you know, I think it'd like to go, is not inevitable. So I think this is the idea that that's where the battle is now, I think, to kind of determine that path. And that's the last bit of table thumping moment, if you like. So I think we're all kind of, as educators, people at universities, we're all kind of part of that battle. Uh, Robert Kennedy was sort of Slightly kind of grandiose state, as we were talking about South Africa. But you know, Rob Kennedy feels that the greatest the beneficiary itself. We need to do, kind of do a little piece and it's from these numberless, act, diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. I think that's where we are kind of with open education. That's where we done. Thank you.